help me welcome uh, uh, Mr. Steve Kiteto, Karibu Sana, uh, who is going to bring the word of God to us. He's married uh, with uh, three children, uh, girls. Mm? Karibu Sana, Steve. Good to have you here. Let me pray for you, and then you can continue. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the word which you've brought us today through your servant, Steve. We want to pray for him that, Lord, you continue to use him. You've prepared him. And, Lord, we are waiting to hear what you're talking to us through him. We thank you for his family and his ministry that you've given to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nico. Um, you've taken me way back, just remembering that meeting in, in, in Mesora. Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right, I really want to appreciate uh, the children. So I know we've done many things. I'll do another clap. You'll just be seated. So I just want you to do this. So just listen first and then you'll go for it in appreciation of what the children have been doing. So here's what we'll do. Can you try that? And one more time. And one more time. And for the Sunday school teachers. Fantastic, fantastic. My name is Steve Kiteto. Like uh, Nico has said, I came with my daughters. They're all seated in front here. Uh, one of them claims to be a professional teenager. And then the others are, you know, following her. Uh, one is much younger at seven. My wife wasn't able to join me here today because Alirudi uh, Shule Akongumbaru, doing her <laughs> master's in um, uh, marriage and family therapy. Because God has called us into the, in the marriage and family ministry. Um, and I have a background also in many of the transitions that were being talked about here crossing over. And so for her, she wasn't able to come, Lizzie. Um, but um, I'm glad that you know, she released the daughters to come with me. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, Pastor Nico, you said I have only three hours. Eh? All right. I'll try and uh, make sure that I utilize the time well. Uh, but... I am glad to just bring the word of God to you. And so I would love to just begin with it because it's in, in the book of um, Deuteronomy. Uh, we talked about um, camp. I had somebody talk about camp, which you'll be doing, I think, from tomorrow. And those are experiences. I'll come back to that. But God seemed to have taken the children of Israel through an experience. They were camping the whole time for 40 years. Camping and hiking and expeditions. And that was a place of experiences. So I want to give you a bit of background to the verse that I'm going to read so that when you read it, you actually understand from that context. So the verse is in Deuteronomy 6, but just a bit of a background is God had sent Moses but he had spoken to, Mo, to, to Moses' forefather, Abraham, 700 years prior and told him, your people will be in Egypt for 400 years. So there's a whole 700 years gap between the time God is speaking to Abraham, telling him, your descendants will be in Egypt for 400 years. And then after the end of that 400 years, in fact, it ended up being 430, God sent this camp director called Moses to go and rescue his people and journey with them all the way from Egypt, taking them to the promised land. Now, through the process in the journey, a couple of things happened so that Moses was disqualified from crossing over to go to Canaan. And so... By that time, Moses had already given them the ten laws, the ten commandments as we know them, but God saw it fit to add to them another 603 bylaws, just to add to the ten. So they say, you know, the Jews ended up having 613 different laws of what God is saying about what they should believe and how they should behave. And so when you look at that, Moses is now right before he crossed the Jordan and he feels the need to give them his parting shot just before he exits the scene. 
And so the entire book of Deuteronomy is actually a summary. We like hearing words of people who are about to die. So this is what he was saying. I don't know how long it took. And these were like 1.5, 2 million people. I don't know where he stood and how they did it. For all of them to hear him give this long speech, the entire book of Deuteronomy. So now he's telling them of what they're going to experience when they cross over to the next journey in Canaan where the promised land was. And so the words that are being spoken are to prepare their minds and hearts to really believe in this God who had come to rescue them and to bring them into this promised land. And so when you hear now the words, they are directed to, I believe, every adult who was seated there and their children were in the hearing like today. And so he begins his speech from, of course, you read the whole book, but I've just sectioned out section, chapter 6 from verse 1. And so I will just read... Um, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I have given you and so that you may enjoy long life. So let me just pause and make a bit of a comment there. He's talking to them about the commands. Okay? The decrees, the laws that the Lord God directed me to teach you. So he's entrusting them now to the adults in the hearing. Maybe something that I should say and here you can indulge me a bit. Anyone who is 20 years and above, just put up your hand. 20 years and above. So by the time Moses is talking to them, all of you were actually dead. All of you who have put up your hand. Because God was so troubled, was so grieved by these people who are so obstinate, who are not obeying him, he decided, you know what? Anyone who is 20 and above is going to die. And he killed all of them in the desert so that this was now a new generation he was speaking to. So this new generation needed a new software to run in their hearts and especially where they were going in, 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 across the Jordan in Canaan. And so when you hear some of these words, it's with that context in mind. It's almost like Moses is reinstalling a new software because the other guys did not live up to the expectations and God decided, let me do away with those guys who put up their hands and let me deal with those who are younger. Almost like the age of responsibility to, in God's well, you know, 20 and, uh, and above, you're held responsible as far as God is concerned. So he's telling them this, that Moses is saying, I'm bringing you these laws, decrees, um, as God, you know, God has directed me to teach you, so that you and your children after them may fear the Lord. Please note, God is a God of time. I mentioned the 700 years between Abraham and Moses. Moses, 700 years. So God is very much interested in just the timeline and also the generations that come. So here he says, your children and their children. Like for you, your children and their children. So he's already thinking long term. So that whatever it is that he is passing on to them, it's a software that they are required to be responsible to pass it down the generations. And so as you're hearing this, we are drawing the wisdom of what God's heart was for the children of Israel, but knowing that that's really the same wisdom that he would want us to embrace today that we are to teach our children, which we've been doing very well with the, all the display here, but so that they can also, we really think about that our children will become grandmothers and, and grandparents. I tell my daughters, yeah, yeah, you're going to become a shosho one time. If you think long term, or you yourself, maybe you've never really thought of yourself. Maybe you're a young person, you're like, ah, God blessing you, you will have children, 
and down the generations, you will be called Ashosho Aguka. And so he's saying, pass these words, these teachings down the generations so that um, now we can read the next verse, which will be verse 3. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God, your ancestors promised you. So again, there's a call to obey. Children, in verse 5, in chapter 5 of Ephesians, they say, children, obey your parents. In this case, all of us who are in the hearing of the words that Moses was speaking to the people were being asked to obey. Prior to that, by the way, he said, so that you may fear the Lord. So sometimes we talk a lot about loving the Lord. But sometimes when fear of the Lord, just the reverence of God, checks out, then people do all kinds of things. So just teaching them to have the fear of the Lord, to obey the Lord. And then we go to verse uh, 4 now. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So again, reminding them, I am the only one. I am to be your only one. Anyone who has gone through any relationship towards marriage or probably you're dating or probably you are, you know, you know, you have a fiance, there's that exclusivity that you always desire to have so that no one else messes up with your girl, your boy, okay? You do things that are so out of this world, out of the ordinary, because you want to be the exclusive one for this one. So God is reminding them, God is one. So you, and you'll hear this, you shall have no other gods. All that is meaning, please, don't play me. I am the only one. I am to be the only one. I saw my friend Moody somewhere here. Uh, do you still bake cakes? You do? Yes. So some years back, I was calculating, 16 years back, I decided I was going to surprise my, my to-be fiancé. So I asked Moody, bake me a cake, and I want you to hide this ring in the cake. And so he, now no, put your tips, so that uh, those who want to go that way, and so he did a fantastic job. We hid the box in Ugondani. Uh, so you can see the chemicals that were running in my, in my brain doing extraordinary things for this one person so that she will be the only one. Um, and so Mude, it, it succeeded. It succeeded. The cake uh, happened, engaged her. Uh, not, not more than 12 months after that, we got married. And we've been married 15 years now with blessing of the, of the daughters who you brought. But just to bring a point that God is like that. He, he wants to really reach out with all the kinds of things and he has completely given himself out. You saw the, in the play just the sacrifice that he has done to woo us in. And so he's asking us, make me your only one. And in other places you'll hear God is a jealous God. Uh, and the jealous is protective. I want you to be mine. Um, and so that's what God is offering with everything that he has. Uh, but many times we are found unfaithful. And so the next verses now bring out what God expects us uh, to do. And so in verse 5 it says now, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So again, please take note of the word heart. In the Hebrew mindset, the heart, you know, because we are taught in Greco-Roman thinking, which is even our education system is sort of based on that, they break apart the mind and the heart. But for the Hebrew mind, the heart was everything that is internal. When you say do everything with all your heart, you know, like, Put your heart into this work. It means put your all internally, your thinking and your emotions in it. And so it says, love God with your heart. It's really with your mind and with your heart. You'll find in other verses, for example, it says, David led them with integrity of heart and skillful hands. The integrity of heart means everything internally. He led them with all that he had internally. So 
when you come to the New Testament, there are others that say, love God with your, especially Luke, because he was, he was Greek. You know, he was writing from not a, his mindset was not the Jewish. So you'll find that he adds love with your mind as well, probably for his readers so that they can appreciate the double head and heart. But for the Hebrew mind, it was the heart, which means everything. Then love God with your soul. Again, in the Hebrew, I think the closest translation of the soul I find is the Swahili one. Uh, nafsi. Nafsi yangu. When you hear nafsi, um, it's like everything internally. The, the essence of who you are, your being, the one that God breathed, and then you came alive. Nafsi. So love him with your everything, every atom in you. And then love God with your might, which is strength, your energy, be energetic, like how they were dancing here. Be energetic, love God like that. So all that to say God is really saying, as I have loved you, love me back. And you have the picture of somebody who's wooing us into a relationship with him and wants it to be very exclusive. You and I, you are my people. You, I want you to be my people. Then the next verse is um, verse 6. It says, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. So again, the central place of the heart, your mind and emotions, put those commands, put this software to run internally inside you so that it's always just running internally, cleaning up all the viruses that we run with. Now, everything that we carry from our past, our backgrounds, our baggage, whatever it is, let this word run in you and put it in your heart uh, so that now we see the next thing and how you suppose now after you put it in your heart, then now to begin also passing it down the generation. Of course, starting with the very children who we have and then moving forward. But I hope you notice that it starts with us first. They are our hearts. And then now we go to verse 7 uh, that says, impress them on your children. After you put them on your heart, now impress them on your children. Um, I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear impress. Some picture in your mind, impress them in your children, all right? Um, talk about them when you sit at home. So it's very interesting. If you think about your home and when you sit down when you are from work and you're just hanging out in the house, when you assess your time audit, what do you spend time doing, let's say in one evening, what do you find yourself doing the most? So in this verse, it's being said, you should actually be using that time to talk about stuff. Just talk about things that, you know, um, the scripture that you have learned, the commandments, and tying them to real life. One of the things I think that we have done sometimes is we read the word, Sasa tunacha hiyo ni ya kanisa. Alafu tunaingia vitu kwa ground. And then we wake up again, tunafanya ya kanisa. So it's like a dichotomized life. But he's actually saying, no, no, no. Use this as a template to interpret your reality. So everything you're going through, you're like, ah, what does the scripture tell me here? You pray. The Holy Spirit reveals to you, no, no, do this. When you're caught by a traffic cop, and you're thinking, ah, see, ni mkanje tu, sotano, tuachane. And like, no, no, no. I'm supposed to be shining the light. I'm supposed to be bearing the image of God before this. And so, okay, I will go and spend the time. One day, this mami apu ko judge. And actually, probably you're actually on the wrong. So pay for your sins. And then, wendele na maisha. And that is the way, in terms of applying the scripture. And then it goes on ahead to say, not just... Um, you know, impressing and not just uh, talking about them in your home, but when you walk along the road. So in the context then, of course, they were walking a lot because they didn't have cars. But I would say travel time should be the time that you're also having these conversations. Difficult conversations. I remember my daughter was doing a Zoom class and there was a child across seated somewhere, and they just began discussing before the teacher got in. And one of, the child, one of the children said, last Sunday, when I was in church, one child in my Sunday school asked the Sunday school teacher, this is like a 12, 13 year old conversation, is God trans? 
It's a church. If I mention to you, you will, you will know it. It's called trance. You know what trance is? Trance by the whole LGBTQ. You know, there's somewhere there, there's trance. So the kids are saying, if God created Adam and Eve, male and female, and they all came from him, is he then trans? And I think they actually meant bi, although they used the word trans. So those are the conversations that our kids are beginning to have. And they're asking each other. And they ask the Sunday school teacher. That's what teacher, eh, kina teacher Waswa and uh, kina teacher Steve, probably those are the questions that they, 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 they get. And so I listened to that. It came to my house and I'm like, I have to process this. So my daughter told me, you go and ask your mom. You go and ask your mom whether God is trans. And then you come and discuss again. But then I, I, when we were driving down, I, I, I decided, let me, let me, let me apply, apply this scripture and use that time to say, so what do you think? What do you think? Is God trans? Is God by? And we went into a very wonderful conversation and then we eventually concluded and said, you know, as human beings, we create a lot of labels for ourselves. And then we create the labels and then we superimpose them on God. But it should be the other way around. It is God who defines who we are. He created male and female. Genesis 127. And then out of that, multiplication. And so you cannot create your little labels and then you transpose them to God. No, no, no. You should be listening to God. He is the authority who defines for us who we are in terms of our identity, in terms of our sexuality. And those are the conversations that I think as parents, those are the difficult conversations that we don't want to get into or we are fearing. And there's a place for equipping, so no, not to worry. Maybe those, that's something that we can organize to have these conversations. But those critical conversations means our scripture should be answering all these questions. I've just picked one that is, is you, know, you know, probably puts us off in a disequilibrium of sorts. But every answer to our life's question needs to be coming from the Bible and pointing it back to that one. Because where they were going was a very multi-theistic place, meaning there are many ideologies just like we have today. They are going to Canaan where they sacrificed children to Molech, they believed in many gods, they believed in idols, Today, we believe in so many things, and there are so many just very innocent, I mean, statements that are thrown around. Ah, that is karma. That is karma. Everything goes around. But karma, if you study what karma is, it is, you know, you, you, is it, you reincarnate and become some animal. If you are very nice, maybe you become a rabbit, or <laughs> if you're really bad, unakuwa um, kuwamende. Um, you know, when you come back. But you know, we, we use it normally, but you don't realize actually we are singing the song of somebody else, not the one who has called us in terms of the ideology and the belief that we have come to embrace. Oh, we find that there are so many beliefs now in terms of you're told, hey, go and meditate and go and, um, and you know, it's just exercise. And, you know, the Eastern religions have really come to give us a lot of, hey, you can do this, you can do this for your health and all that. But also it pushes you into very deep uh, spiritual, if you, fall, if you keep following through. Um, and even the LGBTQ, it is an ideology, by the way. It's very well thought out. It is an ideology that we need to have answers to using the truth that God has given us. But let me finish with this verse and then, and then I'll wrap it up. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols. Now, this is the outward. There was that initial um, tree that I had shown. If you could just go back to that. Um, when you look at that, there is the belief. A lot of time spent building the belief. If you read the verse up to this point, and then it says, now from here on, now tie them as symbols on your, uh, symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your door, of your houses, and your gates. So, over houses, door frames, gates, and it was almost like any excuse to remind yourself of me, 
of the of 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 the of the decrees. For today, probably you would say, "What? Have it as a maybe a key holder, put it on your screen screen saver, um, right?" You know, we used to laugh our parents, our mothers, fathers, maybe our grandparents. Uh, this is it. Jesus, the silent listener to every conversation. Those types of things actually are really good. They are symbolic because then you remember. But there's some very strategic areas where you can put scripture. Is the toilet. When you're seated over there and you're a captive audience, you put the scripture there and it reminds you wherever you go. Maybe on the fridge, you stick some fridge magnets. Just something that reminds you. So basically take every opportunity to remind yourself and to remind you know, children on what God has asked us to do. So all these things, if I were to summarize them, I would say we need time. In fact, my sermon title was Parent Time. Because in time, you need to be able to talk. You'll need to be able to instruct. That's just a, a, um, an acronym that you can remember, hopefully. You need to model. That's the M. And you need to give them experiences. So let's just summarize what I have just been saying from talk. So if you go to talk, there are very many opportunities that you have at home to just talk about this. I always say talk, 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 talk. There are a lot of distractions that we have as adults, but children always have questions in their minds. And they will ask you the most difficult questions, at least as parents. I remember being asked when our daughter was age six, at least those that we found difficult. Said, so, mom, if you have sex, will you be taken to juvenile? So, Unashindua, he sex at J Fundisha, at J Fundisha juvenile. All those two words we've never taught them. So where did it come from? And so we, I came week one, week two, one, one. But then we pick a story because I'm assuming because of you and your daughter monge your story. But it wasn't coming through. Month two, I can't remember how long I waited. I was like, no, 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 no. I think I need to address this. God was gracious. He provided an opportunity. We we're reading the Bible through somewhere in Old Testament. And so I came to this place of the virgin daughters of Jerusalem. And we had taught them, when a new word comes up, ask me what it means. And so I noticed they had not asked. Maybe they were sleepy. I read it slowly again. The virgin daughters of Jerusalem. Ah, dad, what is a virgin? Ah, yes. Now, virgin is a girl who has never had sex. And I could see my six-year-old thinking, man, no, 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 but dad, you're not talking about probably even thinking, where do you even get the nuance of shame at six? And then the four and a half was saying, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know what is sex. Oh, okay. Uh, tell me what is sex. Uh, he said, ah, it is when you have, when you have, when you love each other so, 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 so much, forever, forever, forever. <laughs> and then you kiss. And then you sit in the bed, and then you kiss again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. That is, and I was like, we didn't have a TV then, by the way. So just to remove that, they didn't watch it in our house. But then we knew where they had watched it from. It was a scene that, and they had discussed. So just saying, I'm just saying, if your six-year-old has not asked you, that question, they're probably asking somebody else. Six, seven, they've gone to school, they're already processing that in one way or another. And sorry, I've just set you up. Um, you, might have, you might be asked today. So uh, you, you need to come up with answers. But just opportunities are always there at home. Travel time, I mentioned that. Bedtime is fantastic for stories. And even the morning time routines before you take them to school. I remember the morning time, I remember teaching a parenting program that we run called Kizazi Kipia, by the way, which is new generation inspired by just this, the idea of a new generation. And there was a very uh, busy uh, 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 marketing executive who said 
their, her son who must have been, I think the son was around either seven, but was becoming very unruly. And she couldn't almost just contain her. And she's a single parent. She's trying to sort of contain her. The grandparent is somewhere far off. And so when we went through this, the idea of reading the Bible together, creating a rhythm that you can always fall back to either the morning or evening, depending on how your schedule is, because there's some work, some jobs you leave very early, which is fine. Uh, but maybe with evening, eventually you take your home. So she took this to heart and said, I'm going to spend just 10 minutes. I'll not leave before he leaves. Uh, or rather, you know, the way I normally live. I just spent 10 minutes. We read a proverb. I think she got a guide and she read 10 minutes. And she did that for just that one week. By the following week when we were meeting for the next session, said it's like a miracle. My son has come down and all he needed was just that time. Sometimes children act up because they just are asking for your attention. And you just that little attention, 10 minutes only, imagine. Just began reading the word and then send him off to the, to the bus and then she would jump into her transport and head out to work. And said it has transformed her son in one week. And to just time and just reading the word and you've brought God in this story and then you pray together. And I believe God actually really holds your hand when you are obeying him. I, I can tell you many stories of, <laughs> of just God coming through for us in, in very interesting ways of, because we had, we had you know, just obeyed him in terms of just having this conversation. But let's go to instruct. Instruct uh, as one of the things that time we need to take to instruct. And I'll just read this verse in Ephesians. It says, fathers, this is an instruction for fathers who are here. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It is just very clear. Fathers, it is your role to train these children, to discipline them in the instruction of the Lord. But then you might ask me, how about mothers? Maybe the husband is not there or the father of the child is not involved in the bringing up of the, ch of the, of the child, because that happens a lot. I, 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 I get wisdom from Paul. He allows us to see where he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith. He's talking about Timothy, his son, in the you know, spiritual son. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So mothers, we are natural transmitters of faith. Part of the reason why I believe God was telling the children of Israel, don't marry women of other religions or other faiths. Don't marry too many wives like Solomon was told that. It's because part of it is this, that the transmitter of faith from a nurturing perspective, which comes so naturally, will actually be shifted. So it means if you embrace your faith well and you have the word hidden in your heart and you are living it, then it becomes very easy for your Timothy or the child that is God has given you in your hand to actually embrace that faith. And God is faithful. He will raise a Paul, another man to mentor and to take him to the next level for the responsibilities that he or she has, the child who is in your hand. And then, of course, there's the verse that we all love. It was actually mentioned here today. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. So we cannot overemphasize the place of instruction. But it is when you have these opportunities as you're driving, as you're in a matatu, as you're walking, in the morning when you create that rhythm, or in the evening, it is during those times that then you are able to actually instruct. Because children are very relational. We're just, they're just like us, you know, adults. When you're relating to them and they feel your friendliness, it is very easy to actually instruct them and, 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 and lead them to the place that, you know, God has asked you to lead them. But let's go to the third one, which is modeling. And in this, we talk about habits, just different habits that you can build in terms of modeling. 
It's very powerful, this modeling thing, huh? Because even your children will hold you accountable. As they grow older, they begin asking you, like, uh, like the other day I was being asked, you've told us to be making our beds before we come to breakfast. Lakini ni mechungule hapo, kwa hiyo, bedroom yenu, nikaona, there's no, you should model, of course I'm there, no, I mean, we've already told you, you should obey. But I'm actually, she's saying the truth. She, it is much easier for them to just follow if you are doing it. In fact, they say, um, and this I learned from a friend who is a football coach, he said, you can teach all you want, but you will reproduce who you are. So whatever you do and how you behave, even without talking, most likely is what you're going to reproduce. Now, of course, God is gracious. Not all of us learned faith from our parents. God is gracious. He'll raise Nico. He'll raise all the teachers. They'll bring the word. My wife got to know the Lord through the ministry of Sunday school teachers. So Sunday school teachers, good job. Uh, but if you are here and you're hearing the word, it is your responsibility from God to actually partner now with the church. And in fact, it's your primary responsibility. Nico, what it does is actually just to reinforce what you've been doing at home. That's the assumption. That it's already happening at home. Now it's your time to actually do it, to build this faith. It was put to the test during COVID, if you remember, when now all of us were at home. And now we're still fiddling around with our online. Now we've gotten it right in terms of church and everything. And so it was, how, how do you actually live out your faith when you don't have a place to take the children? It's almost like in Kama systems, it calls test you uh, just to see who will be. And so we took it seriously. We put these rhythms. Every morning we'd read the word and we'd reflect on it. And because we're being bombarded so much by all negativity, if you remember, you know, people's G are dying in England. G now, I mean, the whole world was shut down. I don't need to repeat the story. But we found a lot of solace and a lot of hope. This church is about hope in the word of God. Because we went to Psalm 91, and then we said we're going to memorize it as a family. All of it. And, uh, you know, and we just read it. And of course, my old brain now, I wasn't able to actually memorize all of it. Uh, my daughter was very good. She managed to do the whole of it. So it was almost like a button. Uh, able to kumbush it. Ding! And she would actually just recite it. Our daughters really were good at just reciting the verse. And we sensed, personally, I sensed this faith beginning to well up in me. I really believed God is going to protect us. And my faith also says, if I die, I'll die in the Lord. And that was still hopeful. Um, and, and I said, yeah. So when people are saying, do this, do that, I am secure. And we lived our, our lives through the whole time. It was for me, I, I still remember it, that you know, faith comes by hearing. But if you're doing it together, hearing the word of God, you hear it over and over, repeated. That's why God is saying, when you sit down, when you wake up, when you're lying down, all that. I remember when I gave my life to Christ, I was in high school. And so I came, my dad had been raised by my grandparents who were Tukutender as a generation. So in many ways, he was a church guy. But he wasn't like very overt in his faith. Good guy, goes to church, takes us to church. He even remembers to pray sometimes and all that. I remember I gave my life to Christ and he noticed, hey, this son of mine is reading the Bible a lot. Squeeze and soma. You know that first love. You just want to understand. I said, I kidogo, kidogo, okay? so mingi sana. He's thinking, no, now you're going to run crazy. But you know, when I read the word, I was actually on the right track. It's like repeat, 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 repeat. Uh, but of course, he was just trying to take care of his, his, his son. Many years later, by the way, train up a child in the way they should go. At 76, he gave his life to Christ last year. Uh, and he's so passionate about it. And so I remember my grandparents coming to our house. My dad would be, you know, drunk and he's, he's just thinking, ah. and my grandfather would be like, no, 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 my son, this is what you should do. This is what you should do. And I don't know, he was a fantastic dad, but we grew up with a very fun dad. <laughs> um, but in terms of faith, I was just never sure, okay, so... You pray, you've read the Bible five times. You've, uh, uh, but then he came to this place where God brought him to faith. And then now he's so passionate where we go to, he's like he's preaching the word. And so even if you're a child, if you're here, 
and maybe they are not there yet. Just hold on to the promise. To hold on to the promise. I think it comes full circle. If you've done your job, leave it to the Lord. Uh, don't feel like, oh, I did this. No, just leave it to the Lord. He's the one. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who convicts us. Uh, we, we, we cannot save human beings. We can only witness and share the truth and read it diligently, even for my daughters here. Then they have to make a choice to follow Christ. Uh, but I need to be found faithful having done my bit. And that is what we are calling all of us as parents to do. Finally, talking about experiences. You need to actually infuse your life with experiences so that you can tie up all these lessons together. When we are being called to the Awana camp, those are experiences. And there's a tremendous shift and change and growth that happens when we are in experiences mode. Uh, my daughter came back from a camp from Word of Life. Uh, you know, they, they've bounced back. They had sort of disappeared at some point. Now they're back. And it was amazing. She still talks about it to date, several months back, of just how the impact was. So I encourage you, have experiences, create experiences as families. Take them for a hike, go for a camp, travel to shags, all those experiences create opportunities for you to have very easy conversations. I remember at some point in 2019, I believe, 1819, several dads from our cell group decided we're going to begin taking our older children from around age seven outdoors. We happen to be two dads who really love the outdoors. And so we said we'll be doing outdoors to a camp on a Friday night to Namkia Uko Saturday to Nanda hike. I love we have these children cook for themselves. So seven, eight, nine, ten year olds were cooking for themselves. The first one was burnt offerings, chakula yote. I think to lead in fact they were even hiding from us. They went that illich sufuriamchelo wake sundapo chinia coffins. And then they said now chakula uh, haikuiva. So we ended up now doing the nyama that was really hard and some bread for breakfast. So, of course, we had the consequences. Breakfast haikua the following morning. So we had to divide your breakfast. Can you slice mbili? Mbili ama moja, moja. And then week, month two, we went again. And now they went and said, no, 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 no. We have to, our mothers have to teach us how to cook. So they went. By the time they came back, they brought their A game. Next week, next month, by the time we're doing maybe week, uh, month seven, because it was very consistent, every month we'd go out. The mothers said, we have to come and see what you guys are doing. And so we said, no, 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 this is for dads. This, this, this is for dads. I don't know what we do as dads by that time. We just sit by the bonfire. Tunangojia chakula within one, one and a half hours in Akuja. And it's being brought by seven to 12 year olds. All of them were between that age. And it was fantastic. They learned then we told them, now you have to also plan using our phones. Muonge budget ya chakula, nani ata pika, nani ata kwa team leader. Alafu nani ata pitch tents. So you manage your people who are pitching tents and who will pitch down the following day. And so they are doing leadership stuff. They are waking up. They are, oh my God, panga po ibo si tulangalia tu. Tunale tulangatuka report, oh nani ya mekata, hey, we kuja, what's the problem? Uh, go back. After a while, it was such a well-oiled machine, the moms were like, what did you do to these children? Because now they want responsibilities at home, they want to cook. So again, just to say, and I'm not saying mothers can't do this, fathers, you can do stuff. I know it can be boring sitting at a restaurant, okay, fine, we can do that. But you can also make it fun, and it doesn't have to be the hikes. Maybe it's something else, your own talents, or like a job, apprenticeship, experiences, create experiences for them. And then they grow. When the mothers came, by the way, they were so frantic. They're like, we just sit here. And then the food comes. Yeah, well, yeah just sit, sit. Chakula ina come. Hey, one of them sneaked out. At your house, you can eat oily milk. That's why we don't come with you. <laughs> now, you, hey, Rudy, now next time we're not coming with you. We are doing our thing. And so it really built them. Um, there's one now who is in a school, they, you know, where they're going to do the PA, and he's looking at. Ah, you wanna say to find it? 
Sio niambie tu niwapangie hii kitu mbio mbio like they are so confident they are able to actually manage themselves. And so again, create experiences. The church is a fantastic place to create these experiences partner with the church because ultimately my last point is to go back to this um verse here. Uh, if you could just go to the ne- to the last slide. Um time. So talk about these things instruct model and create experiences but all this is so that that first that tree in fact i really liked this, this girl who stood oh well, she was on the screen and said abc uh, i forget her name but she said i think admit admit your sins and then believe and then confess and then she showed the green and said grow which was like she had just preached my sermon on that tree work on the belief then the behavior sometimes we do it wrong as parents we want very good behavior vile tulifundishwa but then we've not worked on the belief but let's like say you behave what you believe and so if you tell me i mean i don't fear snakes i don't fear snakes then i come and throw a rubber snake at you alafu natoka mbio like what you will kona nipatia tu nipanganga but the real you is you actually don't believe but if you really believed that this is who i am this is what god has told me to do then there will be an, we should be able to see it in your behavior so when you tell me this is what i believe i just need to look at really how you behave and then i'll tell you no 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 what you say is different from what you really believe and that process requires time it requires a lot of intentional time and just this area of time as i conclude the window is short it shuts very quickly i worked in an organization where we took 13 14 year olds maybe you've had the rites of passage program so we handled many churches we trained many churches so i had the privilege of seeing the summary of what the parents had been doing for 14 years because within 10 minutes at camp you can see how this child is behaving and you can tell unajua unasema ukiona vimeundwa ukiona vyaelea ujio vimeundwa so that kuunda and of course in sheng now kuunda is something else but but you've taken time to mold this child to become this and so it requires time but that window of time shuts down by the time they are 13 14 very impressionable up to the teens they're still very impressionable i would even say up to even campus you have a ministry for campus i remember being talked to in campus and listening to this preacher and saying umsana makes sense and i made cause corrections of my life so the, so that window is like that place for when the, the seasons when you need to plant and the seasons for harvesting so utilize the window for planting well and the season for pruning and the season for kupalilia so that when they are older they will just naturally follow what you have spent time investing in and so just remember that it requires time but the time is short and so we need to really take advantage of the window of time shortly they leave our nest i can't believe my daughter is 13 ati anaenda through ropes ile nilifundisha wazazi for almost 16 years um, before we started badili experience now i'm the one who seated there being told this is what you do with your with your daughter uh, and so just to encourage all of us that it is not difficult the word is near us we can always share it with our with our children but we need to have it in our hearts first uh, so that we can just naturally transmit and it's a continuous process of 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 being transformed and together with our children because ultimately all of us are god's god's children thank you very much god bless you allow me to pray and then i just hand it back to uh, pastor nico heavenly father thank you for just reminding us really from the time we walked in here all the presentations and displays by the children just displaying the investment that has been done in this church i pray may bless the pastors thank you father for the parents who've been investing as well the sunday school teachers uh, the children thank you for your word 
thank you for reminding us that we're supposed to repeat it, to hide it in our hearts, and be able to display it and leave it out down the generations so that we can say, you are faithful, even one, two, three, four, five, a thousand generations to come. And so we're grateful for this moment, um, and I pray that you will help the word that is in our hearts to grow, to bear fruit 30, 60, 100, multiple times, uh, and so that we'll have the fruit that lasts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's appreciate uh, Steve. Asante sana. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a service. It's been a service, and we want to truly, truly thank God. We've come to the end of our service. Uh, even the children are just coming to just do the benediction as we finish. Let me invite our visitors, those who've come here for the first time, if you just put up your hands, our hospitality team will be receiving you. Our visitors, uh, visitors, first time visitors, please uh, just put up your hands. Our ushers and our hospitality team will be receiving you. First time visitors, first time visitors, if you're here, please just at the back, our hospitality team will be available to receive you. Have we been blessed? Have we been blessed? Let's stand up and just once again appreciate our children for the wonderful ministry they've done and the children ministry. I just want to do the benediction for us and then we, we can finish. Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful time in your presence. We want to thank you for being with us, allowing us to worship you, to be led in worship uh, by our children through the through the music and the different presentations we've seen, but also through your word, that, your, that, the, that the Bible says that we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your word. So thank you, and we thank you for our speaker today. We pray a blessing upon him and his family. Now, Lord, we ask that you will release us with your blessings. May you keep us. May you watch over us. May you make your face to shine upon us. May you be gracious to us as we go into this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you so much and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Yeah, God bless you so much and enjoy your Sunday barbecue. <laughs>